Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Sayers. I'm organizing the seminar today. Um, as well as the people in the room, there's a live stream um, with an unknown number of people watching. Um, after each talk, we'll take questions from the live audience and also from the live stream audience. We'll see how that goes. Um, uh, I'm really delighted with the range of speakers that we've got today uh, presenting about uh, attitudes and prescriptivism uh, in language in different languages and different contexts, everything from everyday attitudes towards language varieties to government language policy and everything in between. Um, I don't have much more to say. Um, as, I said, uh, as I said, we'll pause after each talk for questions. Um, and if we have time at the end, then we'll maybe have a, uh, a longer chat as well. Okay, right, I'm going to shut up and pass over to our first speaker, Liz. Thank you, Dave. First of all, many thanks to Dr. Sayers, to Dave, and to the University of Uvascula for hosting us here today to discuss this topic. Many years ago, I worked in the Department of Languages at this university, and it's my pleasure to be back here again. Also, in light of what's happening right now in Finnish politics, it's my pleasure to be the woman on this panel today. I couldn't go without mentioning that Finland, as of this weekend, will have its youngest female Prime Minister is set to be official tomorrow when it goes through Parliament. So, congratulations to women in politics in Finland. Other than the fact that I happen to be a woman, one of the reasons that Dave invited me to come today is because I've just published the book that you see here on this slide. This book is a textbook which is written from the point of view of English as a global language. The book, called Making Sense of Bad English, with bad English in quotes, of course, because I don't believe in bad English. Uh, it appeared in November. The book is divided into two parts, with the first part relating to social aspects of uh, varieties of English, and with the second part devoted to various case studies that explore some of the so-called bad features of different English language systems. The main audience that I had in mind when I wrote this book was for people in places like Finland, or in other words, foreign language settings, so that readers can hopefully gain an understanding of some of the social underpinnings of this foreign language that they speak so well. This element of their education about English, I argue, that is the sociolinguistic side of things, is often missing, despite their vast knowledge of the language. In fact, as these things tend to happen, in the writing of the book, subsequent to the writing of the book, some of my views and attitudes about Nordic people and their relationship to English have changed somewhat. Uh, these ideas are always on the move, aren't they? For example, in chapter one of the book, I present a series of results from a survey that I administer at the beginning of a course that I teach every year at the University of Helsinki, which is my current academic home. In short, I asked the students to supply some answers about their attitudes towards certain varieties of English and what they think about those varieties. It's an attitude test. In many respects, the Finnish students tend to report that they're quite accepting of variation in the English language in general, which is a very interesting finding. Uh, what I've come to suspect, however, and this is still yet to be verified, is that when it comes to Finnish people, when it comes to Finnish people speaking English and also other foreign language speakers of English, are these attitudes actually self-accepting? At a panel discussion I hosted in Helsinki a couple of weeks ago, I raised this question at the end of my talk. That is, Nordic people, including Finns, hold strong ideologies about social equality, including lack of class distinction, gender equality, and basic human rights. This is something that the Nordic model is known for. Why then 
would people here be willing to adopt the discriminatory, class-based, and colonial legacies inherent in the English language? Is this colonialism by proxy? This is the question that I will unpack for the rest of my presentation today. We turn now to some basic facts. It is well established that pluricentric languages, meaning, in brief, a language that has many homes, such languages tend to have a history of colonization. This is how they got to be pluricentric in the first place. This, in turn, leads to a great deal of variation among the way these languages are used in these different home fronts. One case in point that's local is the Swedish spoken here in Finland compared to the Swedish spoken in Sweden. At the same time, although we say that the languages have many homes, these pluricentric languages, the truth is that some language homes are, well, homier than others. When it comes to English, for example, we know that there are some varieties of English, namely standardized Southern British, and general American English, which tend to be the norm providers. Not only for mother tongue speakers of English, but for foreign language learners in places like Finland as well, and other foreign language settings. This type of ideology often goes hand in hand with the notion of nationhood, like I've noted on the slide here. In some cases, we can consider this to be relatively straightforward. For example, here in Finland, there's a relatively one-to-one -one relationship of being a Finn and speaking Finnish, at least compared to other languages. At least this is the prevalent ideology, one that creates a very complex story here in, Finnish, or here in Finland when it comes to Finnish compared to other languages spoken in Finland, but for now I'm going to have to leave that aside. It's a different story for a different day. But my point is that I think we can agree that this relationship of a nation and the language spoken by the majority of the people who live in that nation is more straightforward for some languages than it is for English. We can make an example of myself. I'm a native speaker of English, but what does that mean uh, exactly? What does that mean for me? It doesn't mean that I'm English, of course, right? So the story is very complicated for somebody from a pluricentric language. So with this pluricentric scenario, we get various types of speakers of English all kind of fighting and vying for ownership. Their right to brand their own version of English as the correct one. Who gets to win this competition? Well, there are no surprises here, are there? It's the community of speakers who have the most socioeconomic and various other kinds of institutional power. Here's a familiar map. This is demonstrating the pluricentricity of English. This kind of map was made popular, for example, by researchers on world Englishes, such as Henry Widowson. You can see that the map divides English varieties into two main types, American-like and British-like. So these communities of control, like I just mentioned. If you start counting, what you'll notice is that the British-like nodes on this map appear to be winning still, all these hundreds of years later. Yeah. Or is it? Is it so? There's a major portion of English speakers who are left out of this picture, this rather simplistic depiction. Those are speakers like we have here in Finland, foreign language speakers of English. Here's another depiction, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. This is called the three circles model of English, a concept introduced by the linguist Braj Khatru in the 1980s. This model, of course, takes into account English speaking people from places like we just talked about on this colonial model on the slide that I just showed you, uh, namely in the inner circle. On the inside here, we have the norm providers who tend to come from places like the USA, Britain, Canada, and so on. And the outer circle, which 
is comprised of nation states that have had some sort of a colonial history, usually from Britain. I like was just depicted on the map. But importantly, this model here shows people from settings like this. It was called the expanding circle because, in fact, it's the fastest growing at this rate. And it has been for a very, very long time. The inner circle and the outer circle, the two inside circles of this model, they remain relatively stable population-wise. The current estimate is that people who are foreign language speakers of English in that expanding circle outnumber people like me five to one. The current count is about two billion English speakers in the world. This is a figure from David Crystal. And that means that something like 60% of the current English speakers in the world actually speak English as a foreign language. So now I have some important questions for you, you people who constitute the majority of English speakers in the world today, speakers of English in places like Finland. What are you going to do with this language that you're so good at? Are you going to continue to espouse the same divisive views which characterize this language in its native settings, in inner and outer circle environments? Are you going to rid yourself of that baggage? Are you going to use English as a tool for discrimination or as a tool for inclusion? Here, too, we have a reminder of one of the main aims of my book, which is to educate people from different kinds of settings of the English language about what constitutes attitudes within those different settings. Now I want to shift the focus more specifically to English speakers here in Europe, especially in the Nordic countries. Here we see a map of Europe made by the scholar whose name you see there at the bottom of the image. The, fig the figures used to make this map are based on reports from Eurobarometer in 2012. There are a few things that jump out at me on this map. For one thing, I wonder whatever happened to Iceland, which is curiously missing. But th aside from that, what I start to immediately notice are facts like this. These are some figures from anthropologists, for example. Uh, I'll let you contemplate this on your own to make these connections, but what I want to point out are the figures themselves. In the British Isles and the Republic of Ireland, we have 95 plus percent of the population who report that they can speak English pretty well. If you cross over to the Netherlands, which we'll hear about actually in just a few minutes from Stefan, 90%. These are mostly foreign language speakers. These are astonishing figures. We're talking about the Nordic here. Let's move up. You see Denmark there, 86% of the population. Sweden, uh, Norway is not included here because these are just EU countries, right? But the figures would, of course, be comparable for Norway. 86% uh, of the population of Sweden, and then 70% of the population of Finland. Uh, I'd like to point out that 89% er, of the population of Finland speaks Finnish. These are not huge differences between the penetration of a foreign language and a national language. I think you get the point. This proficiency in English has enormous implications. But for now, I want to focus on these points here. What exactly is it about the Nordic social model that means that we have to be good at speaking English in these places? How did it come about that Nordic success is specifically linked to English and proficiency in English? These are big questions. And of course, we have very big answers to these questions. It's all been very calculated. Here's another depiction, this time worldwide. These are also self-reported uh, English proficiency levels, this time from a global perspective. No surprises here. What you see is that it's still these Nordic countries, these northern countries of Europe, which worldwide seem to have the highest level of aptitude in English, English as a foreign language. Narrowing it down even further, I would like to show you some of these aspects of the survey that I mentioned earlier, which I distribute to my own students at the University of Helsinki. 
One of the most interesting aspects of this survey has been to compare the answers of my students in Finland from those of one of my colleagues who administers a similar questionnaire to her <laughs> students, who are also linguistic students uh, at a university in Indiana, which is in the Midwest part of the United States. As you can see on the survey, what we do is we present a statement, such as, most Americans speak bad English. And the students respond to this on a five-point Likert scale. Either they strongly agree or they strongly disagree. Perhaps you've noticed what I find most shocking about this set of results right here. The American students in the Midwest report some more than 30% of the time, yeah, we do speak bad English. I ask the same question to my students here in Finland. They say, no, of course not. These are Americans. They don't speak bad English. They disagree with this statement some 70% of the time. So this is quite interesting. By the way, I've lost my place here just a moment. I want to point out that this is actually a very typical response. I'm trying, Lynn Murphy calls, Lynn Murphy calls this, yes, in her 2018 book, she refers to the American verbal inferiority complex, and we see that definitely in action here in this particular set of results. But here's what I wanted to show you next. I present the Finnish students here in Finland with this statement, most Finns speak bad English. Some 70% of them either strongly disagree or then disagree with this statement. In other words, the students in Finland express more confidence about their English skills than students do in the USA, one of the so-called main homes of the English language, a norm-providing country. Up until now, I've been focusing on the ideologies apparent in the American students' answer to this question, but now I'm beginning to get curious about the results that I get from the Finnish students. What exactly is going on with the ideology here in a place like Finland? Finnish speakers of English, have you put your own English on a pedestal? You can easily interpret that with this short presentation, it's been more of a thinking type situation than a data-laden project, but I want to inform you that I'm currently working with colleagues in Norway, Iceland, Sweden, uh, to explore these notions empirically, because I find this to be a very fascinating and promising venue of research. I welcome your suggestions and comments as we delve into these matters from a more scientific perspective. For now, I would like to leave you with a few questions regarding a setting like here in Finland. As proficiency in English goes up and up and up, proficiency in other languages goes down. This is not the European model. This is not the ideal aim of the European Union, where we're supposed to have two national language, languages and a foreign language, three languages at least. Who gets to speak to whom with this level of proficiency in English? Is there classism with regard to who is effectively bilingual in English and who is not? And perhaps the most important question, more than any other settings for English, speakers in the expanding circle, that is a foreign language environment, have choices to make. Choices that are not possible for somebody like me. I have the language I grew up with. It's really difficult for me to alter. You get to decide how you're going to speak and also how you're going to evaluate the way others speak. Those are my thoughts for today, and I thank you for listening. Done. Stefan has a question, Dave. Oh, why, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, 
very important point that you made. Um, if you acquire English as a second language, do you import the class distinctions and the colonialism? That's the question. Is it, I've been is trying it to mandatory? Figure, yeah. I'm trying to figure that out too. I've been trying to figure Let's it out for myself. Answer. Yeah. Um, what I notice is that I accommodate my accent. Mm. Since I found out half an hour ago that you're basically not Finnish but American, I feel myself accommodating to you. And on last Friday... Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Is it thank you or not? Uh, I'm not really sure that that's a question. I, I consider that to be something different because I see accommodation more as an act of politeness, really. Yes. Yeah. So I don't think that's quite the same thing, Stefan. What I'm talking about is, um, I think, especially attitudes. Here's, here's what I'm really getting at, is that I'm starting to wonder if foreign language speakers of English in places like Finland, I've also had discussions with people in Norway, in Denmark, and so on, quite open about inner circle varieties of English, but quite critical of how other foreign language speakers of English behave and act. So that's really what I'm zeroing in on here. I, I think what you're talking about is a different phenomenon. Yeah, that's what I'd really like to try to unravel here. Okay, I'm just gonna cut to the, the remote audience, a question from the live stream audience. Somebody has written in that they have an American seven-year-old watching, um, and they are struggling to understand what this is all about. <laughs> oh. So how would you explain the principle here to, a seven -year -old? An, to an American seven-year-old? I would say um, that when you judge somebody for the way that they talk, what you're really doing is judging that person on other stuff that might have to do with the way they look, who they are, or who you think they are. So the way we talk um, becomes sort of a disguise for what you really think about that person in other ways. How's that, seven-year-old? <laughs> and thank you for watching. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. um, I think what you said is uh, fairly apparent. Um, I think that not only do you have people from, say, inner circles and outer circles and expanding circles judging each other mm -hmm. or maybe internally judging each other if they're not saying in your surveys, yeah. um, that even within the circles there's hierarchies as well. Um, the fact that it's connected to whiteness is not a big surprise, I think, to anybody. Yes. Um, the surveys that you showed of the EU, who has the best English, and this uh, English First one, which is, of course, a company where people pay a lot of money to yes. have language instruction, yes, so they're that's not right. biased at all. Mm -hmm. um, no, <laughs> that's right. That's right. You have to consider the source, don't you? Yeah. Um, English is my mother tongue, mm -hmm. and I've lived in Finland for five years, and I spend a lot of time being praised for my British English. I don't speak British English. And then I have to argue with people and explain to them that I don't. And you can tell it comes from not only native speakers of English, but um, people who speak English as their second or foreign language. And you can tell just in those simple remarks that there's obviously a hierarchy, yes. and there's obviously attitudes, like you said, colonialist attitudes, um, privileging of ways of speaking. Yes, and the fact that they exist in a place like Finland, I think, is very, very telling indeed. Yeah. Right. That it gets ex does it get imported along with the language? Does it have to be that way? I just had one question. Um, in the surveys that you do with your students yes. and you ask them about um, you know, do Americans speak bad English? Do you have these students react? Do the students react and say, well, what does it mean to speak bad English? No. No, it's a completely private survey, and I don't really interact with them when they do it because I, I don't want to alter the, the results in any way. So it is a survey. You have to take it as what it is. It's not sure. the most reliable source, but um, for the sake of comparison with my colleague in the U.S., this is perhaps the best way. That's really an, an inadequacy here, at any rate, that we don't really know what the students are thinking. Yeah. yeah. 
we just have to take it at face value, whatever that means, unfortunately. Sure. But the full survey is available on the web, the e-resources website that goes along with my book, if you'd like to okay. take a look at it there. You don't have to buy the book to see that, it's just on the website. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So we're going to move on now to Nick's talk. So we'll, so we'll thank Liz thank again. Thank you very much. the camera can see me properly, that my face isn't cut off halfway. Good? Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'm going to be delivering my presentation in British Sign Language, so I have a British Sign Language interpreter with me um, to interpret into English. So firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much to Dave for inviting me here today. I'm very pleased to be here in Yivaskala again. And I think it's really important as well that sign languages are included in this uh, seminar as well to give a different perspective of language variation so that we have both sides of the coin. We have the spoken language and the sign language. Deaf people, as we know, they love using visual analogies. So I think this idea of a pedestal works quite well in sign language because we can make it very visual. And what exactly does this pedestal look like? And where is this pedestal situated? So these are two questions that I'm going to be exploring in this presentation. So firstly, I'm just going to give some background information about sign languages in case there are some people who aren't fully aware of what sign languages are. Firstly, many people believe that sign languages are universal across the world, and of course that's not true. There, are huge, there is huge variation in sign languages across the world. Secondly, sign languages are iconic, but there is again variation in the iconicity of sign languages. They're not always iconic. Some people think that sign languages were invented by hearing people, which again is not true. It's interesting because the people who have named sign languages have been from hearing linguists and hearing researchers. Sign languages are not based on spoken languages. They are separate languages. They are separate independent languages that have developed naturally. But there is language contact between sign languages too. And there are some really interesting results that come from this, this language contact between sign languages. Language acquisition, so the acquisition of a sign language is also very different because, because uh, sign languages are, tend to be transmitted horizontally rather than inherited or passed on generationally from parents. And that's, I think, one important difference in terms of how sign languages are transmitted. With spoken languages, most children will acquire the spoken language from their parents. So it's transmitted vertically, it's transmitted generationally. But with deaf children, often they'll be the only deaf child in the family, their parents will be hearing. And so the sign language can't be transmitted. And so the way that the deaf child would learn sign language is from school, and they'd learn it from peers. So the transmission happens horizontally. In terms of talking about the different situations of the pedestal, I'll talk about a couple of scenarios. The first one is the ban on sign language. So for a long time, sign languages were banned, and children who were using sign language were punished by teachers, which often meant children had to sit with their hands, had to sit on their hands, and in the kind of old schools, they had the old desks where you would um, lift the desk up, 
So deaf children would lift up their desks uh, so the teacher couldn't see them and they'd sign behind their desks uh, to the other children because they knew that if the teachers caught them signing that they'd be punished. So therefore, sign languages are heavily stigmatized and unfortunately that, stigmat that stigmatization continues today. So when we talk about a pedestal and putting sign languages on a pedestal, I think spoken languages are put on this pedestal because the deaf education system has so long been a spoken language, teaching children through an oralist education method. And I think that's really important for us to consider as well because for deaf people and disabled people, they've been struggling to get their language, to get recognition for their language and their rights. A second scenario is looking at sign systems. And I mentioned in an earlier slide that sign languages are not based on spoken language, which is correct. However, there have been some artificially created sign systems. These were created by hearing educators, mainly part of the education system, for, to be used as an educational tool in order to s teach spoken language. And the way that sign systems work is it relies on a very close morphosyntactic relationship between the spoken language and signed words. But it is not a natural language that's, that's developed naturally from within the deaf community. It's, um, it's very much an artificial sign system. One example of this is, you can see in the photo, the Indonesian uh, sign system. So the Indonesian sign system has taken, s taken signs from other sign languages, put them all together into this sign system. Third scenario is sign languages in use. So for a while now, I've been doing a lot of research in Indonesian sign language. That's my main area of field work. Now, we know there are definitely two Indonesian sign languages. You can see the one here in orange, which is the Katakolok uh, village sign language which is a village in Bali. And Katakolok is a different language, a separate language to the main sign language used in Indonesia. So during my research and my field work, I used a series of different research methods, including uh, mapping and interviews and various other research methods, and collated all of this information to look at the different deaf communities across Indonesia and how that interconnection happened between those deaf communities across the Indonesian islands. And that could be related to where the deaf schools were, where the deaf sports competitions were. And I basically noted down all of this information and mapped it all out so that I could get an overview of how, how all these um, communities were interrelated. And what did I find? Well, I found a number of different factors. Now, Indonesia is a very, very big country with thousands and thousands of islands and v hundreds and hundreds of deaf communities. And the fact there are a number of factors relating to convergence, the convergence of uh, Indonesian sign language. But there are also a number of factors relating to divergence of Indonesian sign language, which is a very natural process of uh, language contact. So, for example, in Indonesia, there is one spoken, there's one national spoken language, which means everybody in Indonesia knows the spoken Indonesian language. But alongside the national Indonesian sign language, there are also regional languages, which are factors of divergence. Uh, it might be useful as well here to give a bit of history on Indonesian sign language. We've known for a while that there has been Indonesian sign language or some form of sign language used in Indonesia, but the language was never named. And it was only named in 2006, which means for a long time, it wasn't really very clear what this language was until research started to be done and a name was actually given. There are different views as well in linguistics, lumpers and splitters. So lumpers tend to believe that the language is one language, whereas splitters uh, prefer to, di to prefer a more regional system. And the question, why split? So why believe in 
the differences rather than the similarities, relates to respecting the differences and the variation, and it's linked to language purism as well. The problem is, across Indonesia, there are around 500 different cities, so does that mean we would have 500 different sign languages? Whereas, on the other hand, the Lumpers, for example, believe in one Indonesian sign language. Indonesian sign language. There are also some factors with socio-political pressures as well. And again, it might be useful here to share a bit of the history with you. When Indonesia declared independence in 1945 from the Dutch, before that, there was discussion and there was this, this idea of having a unified national language. And it's one of the best examples of, um, of, standard, of, um, national un of creating a national language. So the government department in charge of, of standardizing the language thought about engaging with the different communities. Because of the success that they had with the spoken Indonesian language, they believed that this similar, si similar success could be done as well with the sign language. However, some deaf organizations may feel pressured um, to follow the standardization that's happened with the spoken language. But the main question really is, what is Indonesian sign language? And I've asked around for a number of different viewpoints, and it, it's very interesting in terms of the responses that I've got back. Some people have said that it's not something that has really happened yet. Some people have said that um, it would be useful to get all the deaf communities from across Indonesia together and to pick the signs that we're going to use to create Indonesian sign language. Whereas other deaf people have said that, no, it should be based on the variety used in Jakarta in particular. And it's, it's interesting as well because there is also some influence from American Sign Language. Around 30 to 40 years ago, some signs from ASL started to kind of impact on Indonesian Sign Language and they've kind of mixed in with the Indonesian Sign Language. So which language then occupies the pedestal? And there's this phenomenon of language policing within Ind Indonesian Sign Language, where people are noticing American Sign Language or a, 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 particular, uh, pe a particular lexicon that isn't pure or proper Indonesian Sign Language. And so you have this phenomenon of uh, sign language policing. For, and I think this comes from uh, this tradition of Auslan teachers who I think this comes from a tradition of Auslan teachers who have used this practice of language policing and saying, no, don't use this sign, use this sign. And so you have this kind of contradiction. And this is another problem as well, is what, sign, what signs do we use for teaching? Because there's pressure from hearing learners as well who are saying that they want one sign language to learn. So if there's all these different variations of the same sign language, which variation are they going to learn? And a similar question arises for television. And because I think recently Indonesia has um, been providing interpretation on TV. This is a more recent phenomenon. It's very small. You have to have very good eyesight to be able to see this. But it is there. And again, this raises the same question. Because if there's so many different varieties, which variety is going to be, should be put onto this pedestal and broadcast nationally. And finally, more recently, there's this question of what signs do we use online? So, in conclusion, thinking back to the pedestal, where is the space, where is the, the power, where is the visibility of um, this, this competition? Because the spaces are for, sorry, the, and the, these are contested spaces. These are contested spaces. For example, in the classroom, 
So if a teacher is teaching orally, or if the te teacher is teaching through sign language or using a particular sign system, then that's a contested space. What sign language do you use? Another contested space is the government or on television or teaching sign language or online. So you have all these contested spaces and different, who, which act as different pedestals of contested spaces in terms of which signs should be used and which varieties should be used. So I think it's a very hot topic and a very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting lecture. I'm researching, I'm doing my PhD, and I'm uh, researching deaf asylum seekers. And they are not often mentioning uh, the name of the language, what they are using. They just say they are signing, they are just communicating. But for us in so-called Western countries, it's so important to have the name for the language. And in Finland, we have discussions of what, is, what languages we are using. But for example, these asylum seekers are referring to their signing just as upper Arab signing or Arab sign. And they give it, uh, they, the name comes from the spoken and written language that is used in their region. So I sometimes wonder why is it so important for us to label and name the languages that we are using and put them in different kind of categories. Um, Sometimes we could just see that it's very important that we can communicate with each other and be less interested of the names of the languages we are uses, using. There is some kind of ideologies and attitudes that this kind of naming reveals. Thank you very much. Um, just to benefit the people who are watching on the live stream, I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question was about um, research and in particular asylum seekers. And often there isn't a name given to the sign language. They're just using a sign language and there's no particular name associated with it. And so the question is, um, why is it so important to have a name, to name these sign languages? Um, what's wrong with, you know, kind of just communicating and using the sign language? Is the name really that important? I think it's a really good question and a really good point because in Indonesia, from the 1950s, we knew there was a sign language in use, but for 60 years, there wasn't a name. So maybe, deaf, maybe the deaf community didn't want to give it a name. But from my experience learning BSL, I was six years old when I learned British Sign Language. Um, so from six years old to 11 years old, attending school, but I never knew that it was a language. I never knew that it had a name. I never knew that it was called British Sign Language. When I was 21, it was only then I realized that it actually had a name, that it was called British Sign Language, BSL. And I was kind of like, oh, wow, it, it is a real language. And th there's something in that of knowing that it's a language that helps people to really understand. Because spoken languages have a name, so why shouldn't sign languages have a name? Because then that gives it the same quality. And I think it's a really interesting debate at the moment. And the, there's a topic at the moment called translanguaging. And this is really interesting because, you know, maybe you can argue that we don't need to be naming all of these languages, but the debate is talking about, well, what happens if we take all these labels off? You know, is it possible that, you know, how can people, in a time when we are trying to lobby the government and to campaign for equal rights and language rights, if we don't have a name, how does that help in this, this endeavor? So, but the really interesting question, thank you. Right, okay. Um, there was one question from the remote audience um, asking about whether sign language users attach greater prestige to um, sign languages that have a name uh, as opposed to sign languages, regional non-standard sign languages 
that don't. But I think you could address oh, well, that. I, can I ha clarify the question? So who gives greater prestige to the sign languages? Sign language users. The sign language users. But I think you've actually just answered that, <laughs> unless, you, unless you'd like to elaborate. So do you mean if a sign language has a name, does, is there more prestige? In contrast, in contrast to non-standard regional vernaculars, is there that same comparison to spoken? Yes, I think, I think giving it a name is really important. I mean, like in Finland at the moment, there's the Finnish sign language and the Finnish Swedish. Finland Swedish sign language, thank you. Um, you know, so there's two sign languages and both of them have a name. And I've been talking with people here, you know, deaf, the deaf community in Finland, and you know, the deaf community feel it is really important to have those names given because it raises awareness that people across the world know that Finland has two sign languages and both sign languages are given equal respect and equal status because if one has a name and one doesn't, then it is that the same thing? You know, do they have the same equality? I don't know if you agree. and organising the event can't manage. Dear me. I, <laughs> I've been frantically organising today, so you will see me presenting even less coherently than usual. <sighs> right, I'm handing over to Liz to chair the session. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, these same themes of placing language on a pedestal <coughs> in a slightly different context. Um, I'll be talking about the Welsh language in Wales um, and the way um, this notion of language on a pedestal emerges in language policy. Um, and the subtitle is important. Um, I also want to bang, bang the drum for content analysis, which is something of a poor cousin to uh, discourse analysis in our field. Both are important, um, and I'd like to emphasize today why content analysis is important in understanding competing emphases in policy texts. <coughs> so let's start from the start um, with Topes Kutnap Kongas talking about linguistic human rights. Um, <coughs> and those of you who are familiar with Tove's work will know that her principal concern is people's well-being, and especially those who grow up with a language other than the language used in mainstream education, and the way that those people can be structurally excluded from, from education. She links her work to uh, a theory from economic development, capability theory, um, and broadly speaking, capability theory is 
very complicated, far more complicated than I can properly understand. Uh, won a Marcius and a Nobel Prize, and this is a theory of economic development, basically emphasizing that economic development should be more, uh, should be about more than just ca cash, about more than just money, and it should instead focus on the ability of people to improve their life conditions. So linking back to Torve's work in brackets there, these conditions so basic for a dignified life. So that, that's, that's the conceptual backdrop. I'm going, I'm going to link that backdrop of capability theory to three ideologies of language identified by Helder de Schutte, um, um, a political philosopher and linguist thinking about ideologies that exist across language policy. And he's identified these three ideologies that we can pick up on in language policy. The constitutive ideology, instrumental, and intrinsic. And I'll briefly explain the, those three. First of all, the constitutive ideology. <coughs> this is about the link between language and identity. My language is who I am, and I can't be who I am without my language. Thinking about that in connection to capabilities, this might be related to capabilities, but is not inherently necessarily related to capabilities in the sense of one's ability to improve one's life conditions. Next, the instrumental ideology. Um, according to this ideology, language policy should only exist in order to help people achieve non-linguistically defined things. Government, government activity in the, in the realm of language is only legitimate insofar as it allows people to, in the terms of capabilities, improve their life conditions. But the key here is that access to a language, having access to a given language is not in and of itself a benefit to capabilities. It has to unlock other freedoms. Lastly is the intrinsi intrinsic ideology. Um, and Heldersgitte describes this as standing opposed to the previous ideology, the instrumental ideology. Um, this is where languages are seen as valuable in themselves, uh, intangible heritage, that sort of thing, not necessarily connected to well-being. So here are the texts that I analyzed, three texts from uh, covering uh, two decades. Um, these are all published by the Welsh Government, and these are their central flagship plans in relation to the Welsh language. <coughs> so I was, I was aiming to weigh up these three ideologies in these three texts in order to try and understand the balance of these ideologies in this body of language policy. And this is where content analysis comes in. This is why that method was so crucial in understanding the weighting of those ideologies. This involved uh, a very long and laborious trawl of these policy texts. I made very good friends with these three texts over the period of several months, um, reading them through very carefully to understand when these ideologies cropped up. Um, I will pretend that that came about with musical ease. Actually, it's a very difficult process of thinking through the occurrence of these uh, ideologies in different wordings, different framings. It certainly isn't as simple as a word count. So you end up with a tally uh, allowing you in broad terms to understand the weighting of these different ideologies. 
Um, content analysis doesn't always involve a comparison of other research and socio-historical context. Um, I did do that, but I won't be talking about that today. So, some examples from the texts. <coughs> examples of the constitutive ideology about, about identity. Now, as I read through the texts, these seem to fall into two types. Um, the first type was about the identity um, of, people, of the people of Wales overall, um, and the second type about the identity of the Welsh nation as, a, as an abstract concept. Two examples there. So, examples of the instrumental ideology. Um, this, remember, is where, the, the, where language policy is conducted in order to improve people's material conditions. So here are some examples that describe where provision in the Welsh language is crucial for these, as Torbes Kutnav Kangas put it, conditions of basic dignity. So for example, in healthcare, if there's somebody who's Welsh, is not as strong as their English, then obviously that needs, that's an area where instrumental reasoning comes across. Further examples of the instrumental ideology here. Um, these, uh, are a these dem demonstrate a value position that language policy can help people improve their life conditions. Right then, moving on to the third and <coughs> third and final ideology, the intrinsic ideology. This is where language is seen as important in and of itself, as a valuable resource <coughs> regardless of anything else. So, <coughs> like, like the constitutive ideology, as I read through, this seemed to occur in broadly two different types. The th in, in type one, the Welsh language was explicitly named as a direct beneficiary of a given policy action. The language was set apart, this abstract entity set apart as the thing that would benefit from a given policy action um, and not as with the uh, instrumental ideology, individual people's well-being. So a good example here. Welsh Government long-term aim to see the Welsh language thriving in Wales. <coughs> in the second type that I identified, um, these are also plans to increase the use of Welsh, not specifying uh, how that would increase people's well-being, but also not explicitly mentioning the Welsh language. So it's kind of, kind of more implicit. And I thought it was important to separate those two when thinking about whether these are examples of the intrinsic ideology. So I, I wish I had more time to go into the details, but here are the overall findings <coughs> and the weightings, the balance that I was talking about earlier between these three ideologies across the three policy texts. Um, and as you can see, the intrinsic ideology, the, the prioritizing of the language in and of itself, <coughs> significantly and consistently um, dominates the other two across this body of three texts published by the Welsh government. <coughs> Now, splitting, splitting the data into the two types that I mentioned earlier for the constitutive and, and intrinsic ideologies. Um, focusing on the intrinsic ideology, uh, type one, remember, is where the language is explicitly named as the beneficiary of a given action. Type two is where that is implicit, but there is no other beneficiary mentioned. So even with that distinction in mind, still <coughs> the intrinsic ideology, whichever way you split it, um, dominates the other two uh, 
ideologies across the three texts. So, again, I wish I had more time to go into the details, but um, the overall thrust of the uh, the overall thrust of the content analysis is this growing emphasis on the intrinsic ideology um, as, a, as a central underpinning priority within Welsh language policy. That is to say, the Welsh language being placed on a pedestal. But, and again, this is something I really wish I had more time to talk about, having presented these data to senior policymakers in Wales, didn't quite compute. That, that wasn't the intention of the policies for them. For them, the whole principle of community empowerment um, was, went without saying almost. It was obvious. You don't need to spell that out, of course. Of course, prioritizing a language that for so long has been discriminated against, of course, that is about um, improving people's life conditions. That, that, in t that in turn relates to these historical linkages between the Welsh language and longer term nationalist struggles for independence. And um, again, there's more debate there about the way that link between nationalist struggle and um, the Welsh language has tended to overlook <coughs> other structural inequalities like social class, and to prioritize the language as a good in itself, ignoring other inequalities, which plugs into wider debate about the cultural turn. <coughs> anyway, um, so there's differences of, of viewpoint here. But one linger lingering question for me was whether the civil servants who have to implement these policies, whether, whether they read implicit meanings in a policy text or whether they simply whether they simply proceed on the basis of the text so it's everybody's favorite conclusion right we need more research <laughs> um i have to skip through the debate here <coughs> but there's <coughs> obviously a much wider debate um about this balance of addressing historical injustices and acting on people's lives in the present and whether there is a disjuncture there between the uh, historical aspect and the contemporary. Uh, contemporary ethnographic research in Wales has demonstrated some tensions going on when the, with the somewhat unintended separation of people who have English as a, as a first language and Welsh as a first language. Unintended, but a new form of social tension arising from this, this form of language policy. Um, returning to the area of economic development, um, there's another piece of research here emphasizing that caution is needed when developing policy for different ethnic and linguistic groups um, and the solutions that lead towards separation can exacerbate and cause new problems in society. Um, another, another difficult aspect of all of this is that according to the international PISA rankings, of um, uh, educational outcomes. Those kids who learn through Welsh, on average, scored lower than those who didn't. Now this is extremely troubling for an area of language policy that is addressing an historical injustice. This is an obviously an unintended result, but it's very difficult to face up to in the context of capabilities and the role of language policy in enabling greater capabilities. Um, 
very briefly, another way of looking at all of this is to think about gov government expenditure on employment. If you look at, this is, this is a, a very detailed graph of <laughs> government expenditure on employment. Um, if you implement uh, a form of language policy and um, prioritizing or promoting a minority language, naturally that involves creating uh, jobs that operate within that minority language. Um, but of course, this also involves resources that are not jobs uh, involved in translation and so on. So there's more to this. Uh, there, there are extra angles to this in terms of capabilities and the ability of the state, the overall ability of the state, to um, improve people's life conditions. Anyway, so um, ending on a little bit of um, political theory um, about the value of recognizing and valuing difference, as well as um, celebrating what holds us together. And the key thing here is that the freedom to decide your identity is the key to capabilities. Um, which may sit at odds with this intrinsic reasoning about prioritizing the language itself. Um, so, back to beating the drum for content analysis. I think this is very useful in understanding the balance of priorities in a policy text and a body of policy texts. Um, that, in turn, actually helps to present uh, research like this to policymaker audiences. It's more visual, um, easier to understand the, the, uh, the overall findings, along with the key context, of course. Um, but yeah, returning to the theme of the pedestal, that's, that's something that came up here for sure. I think I've run over time, so I'll just end here. Thanks, and I'll cut to questions. Thanks, everyone. the online questions then. First, we have a comment that is not, okay, less a question, more a comment, sorry. But as an L2 Welsh speaker, I see some interesting links between the first talk, that's me, mm -hmm. and this one, as I would certainly place the Welsh spoken by L1 speakers on a pedestal above the Welsh I speak. For sure, yeah, that, that certainly, I linked earlier the research by, um, Charlotte Selleck, and that absolutely comes across in her research. So whoever you are, um, do read her research and you'll find more um, about that. There are a few more questions here. Shall I continue here or does someone here have a question? Okay, I'll continue. Uh, someone asks, does a Welsh version of these texts exist? If so, do you have any I think there's a word missing. Any idea as to whether there are differences in referring to the Welsh language? There, there is. There, there are certainly um, Welsh versions of these texts, of course, along with all Welsh government correspondence. Um, uh, as far as I understand it, um, there's a great deal of there's a great deal of care in parity between the two texts. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I haven't specifically analysed the Welsh versions of those, because as I understand it, there's a great deal of attention to making sure they are the same, but that's a good question. Uh, there's one more question if we have time. It's 28 past three. Sh uh, shall I continue? Maybe we'll leave it to the end. And then okay, we'll, we'll leave it to the end so that we have time for the next speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. Okay, thanks, folks. Dave for inviting me to this. This is hugely interesting. I'm learning quite a lot. 
And it's interesting that many of the things I'm going to discuss will go back to some of this. Okay, I'm going to be talking about Dutch. And Dutch is in fact a quite small language spoken in a small area of Europe. The colored portion in the middle is a place where they speak Dutch. And this is uh, Belgium in the pinkish tints and the Netherlands. And the big red line separates the Dutch from the French-speaking part in Belgium. Anything above is Dutch-speaking. And uh, for your information, Brussels is the capital of uh, Belgium, the European community. It's completely encapsulated in Flanders. It is in principle bilingual, but in practice it's actually Francophone. Okay, the fact that these two countries, these two communities started out as one community uh, doesn't change the fact that they widely diverged since the 16th century. And this is impressive for such a small country to have so different national varieties. Okay, in the Netherlands, basically what happened is that you got a very successful standardization. The 16th century desire for a common best language did materialize in a flexible standard variety, which is the lingua franca of all the Dutch, basically. In Flanders, something very different happened. It did not materialize in a consensus variety. What we got instead, I'm Flemish, although I teach in the Netherlands, what we got instead is language on a pedestal. The worst kind of pedestal, what we have is an unattainable, ideal spoken standard variety, which everybody loves but nobody speaks, which is difficult, of course. This is the official Dutch norm variety of the Vlaamse radio and TV, the Flemish radio and television. What we also got is a hysterical rejection and stigmatization of all the vital varieties that people do speak. But this is the paradox. We have a language that everybody loves but nobody speaks, and we have languages that everybody speaks but everyone hates. A bit difficult, ideologically. Also, We've got a hypersensitivity to spelling and pronunciation errors. Interestingly, the people who hate this also make these spelling errors themselves. So there's no correlation between attitude and practice in this specific community. By the way, I thought that Flanders was bad. Apparently, Iceland and Greece have even more conservative standard language ideologies compared to Flanders. Okay. I don't have time for this, unfortunately, but ask me about this. I'm going to give you some qualitative evidence first what the impact of a extreme conservative standard language ideology is. Then I'm going to move on to the important question, is this the only ideology which impacts standard language dynamics in Flanders? So if you want to see a conservative standard language ideology at work or in operation, what you do is you tease it, you provoke it a little bit. At the beginning of this year, I was looking for a good introduction for a book I am writing with Tude Christiansen. So we decided, let's get some animo into standard language politics in Flanders, and I wrote an opinion piece about language policy of the VRT, the official broadcaster, and the argument ran a bit as follows. If many Flemish people think that the perfect news Dutch of the broadcaster is unattainable, uh, and if young Flemings do not want to speak it, and if moreover the broadcaster itself believes that it should be interesting to allow some non-standard flavoring, especially in the networks geared to younger users, wouldn't it be a nice idea then if the authorities would allow the broadcaster a slightly more dynamic language policy. Now, I made sure I phrased this in as prudent terms as I could. I had 22 people read it. I had my very careful wife read it. She knows I like to provoke. I said, no, no, this is fine. Just publish it. And this is what happened. I had a critical editorial in the same newspapers I had six fuming opinion pieces in the following week, and I had thousands, actually not hundreds, of angry hysterical Facebook reactions. Okay, there was political reactions. The prime minister said, the man is completely out of his mind, we need to preserve standard language Dutch. And there was a parliamentary question. This is one person of the Flemish Nationalist Party said, what further actions is the VRT 
planning with respect to the revision of its language policy. So if you want to have fun with the standard language, write an opinion piece in Flanders. Okay, what I did, and this was basically what I wanted all along, I made a content analysis, Dave, which is what you advocate, of the Facebook reactions, which was great fun, by the way. Um, and what I noticed in this content analysis is that, that they react to claims I did not make in the opinion piece. Very interesting. Also, they have highly similar and recurrent ingredients. The standard, by the way, is a quality newspaper with a typically highly educated audience. And it is these comments which I analyzed. So what did I do? I did thematic analysis, basically content analysis. So I cyclically studied these Facebook posts and all the insults they uh, contained in great detail. And gradually, nine sub-themes seemed to emerge. And I coded all posts for these sub-teams, and I did it on a semantic or explicit level. I did not make any interpretation. It's not necessary either. And apparently, what seems to be the overall story to the nine sub-themes is basically conservative standard language ideology. And if we collide these nine sub-themes into four more important themes, this is something that you get. The standard in Flanders is le point omega. In philosophical terms, this is the end point of any evolution, the logical desired end state of any language. This is implicitly present in all the posts. The second is variation is evil. It leads to communication problems. No, it don't. It, in, it impedes acquisition of Dutch as a standard language. Also, the standard must be protected. It is our moral duty to protect the standard. And it's even more the duty of the standardization agents, teachers, professors, language planners, broadcasters. Fourth point, very important, the non-standard must be rejected. The protection of the standard legitimizes the discrimination of other varieties, of course, and it legitimizes the vilification of any non-protector, in this specific case, myself. I'll show you some, some examples. And interesting, you would sort of think this is the result of the fact that people on Facebook are not that restrained when publishing their reactions, but the opinion pieces in which they appeared had exactly the same structure, but they were much ruder still. This is the end, what you see in the sum quotes. Who is going to determine which variants will be admitted or should be admitted into standard Dutch? The faith healers of the Dutch University, Lord, deliver us from faith healers like Rondelaars. They know not what they do. This is one of the more polite ones, by the way. Interestingly, the person in question did not know I'm Flemish myself. I'm not a faith healer from a Dutch university. Very important that many of the reactions demonstrated something which Irvine and Gaul call ideological erasure. An ideology is a totalizing vision, and anything which doesn't fit in it, you either ignore or you erase. In its opinion pages, the standard of 20 February gives room to one Stefan Gronlaars who is connected to the Nijmegen Radboud University in an unnamed position. Well, I'm an assistant professor there, and it's easy sort of to find out on my webpage what I am. Because this is a deliberate attempt to sort of ideologically castrate me, basically. So, okay. The question is in this case, is this the only value system which motors dynamics in Dutch? If we dig deeper, can we find other ideologies? And do they frame new types of prestige? which motivate the emergence of competitors to the pedestal language. And how do you investigate them? How do you render them visible? Okay, this is a bit on previous research. It's quite technical, but not all that important. If you look at an ideology, an ideology is a value system, of course, which basically is a hierarchization of languages, of varieties in a repertoire. And a conservative standard language ideology typically makes a hierarchization, a ranking, in terms of traditional prestige features. And this is typically the standard language which comes out on top, which is the most prestigious. Also, what has been happening in Europe in the past decades is that you have a sort of a covered, deeper counter-ideology which attributes modern dynamic prestige. And it is this modern ideology, this dynamic prestige, which according to a couple of researchers, 
notably to the Christiansen, is the driving force of the Danish neo-standard model in Copenhagen speech, but also other neo-standards in Europe. And it's the simultaneous operation of the conservative and the modern ideology, which accounts for the mix of standard and non-standard features. Okay, I have to move on, unfortunately. What we did is a very simple experiment, basically. We asked a panel of informants in Flanders to name the first three adjectives which sprang to mind in reaction to a number of Belgian language varieties. First, Dutch as spoken on the official broadcast of VRT. Dutch as spoken in soap series like Thuis or Familie. Problem is tussentaal, the colloquial variety, which is most stigmatized, is a technical term which people don't know. So we use the proxy, a television proxy. Now we ask Dutch with a Ghent accent, Antwerp accent, Limburg accent, West Flemish, Moroccan accent. And then we had a clock on the screen to implement some prompt extraction. And interestingly, in the literature, we found valence information on the types, the adjective types we harvested. So we had information on whether they were considered positive or negative. And then we did vector analysis with these, if I don't have time to explain this, ask me afterwards if you're interested. We needed a way to cluster the adjectives into larger evaluative dimensions. And we used vector analysis for that. So basically what we did, we got a model with 11 positive and 11 negative evaluative dimensions, which subsequently we modeled in a correspondence analysis, and which what comes out is basically something like this. So on the far right, what you see is the most important variety, VRT Dutch, VRT Journal, and it is imbued with adjectives, which keywords, which sort of cluster into evaluative dimensions, enlightening and clear pure, which is obvious ideological prestige. And then interestingly, and we were amazed by that, Thuis Familie, the proxy for Tussetal for colloquial Belgian Dutch, look what it got, four green qualities, proper, familiar, beautiful, civilized. Now this clashes with the very public, very conservative ideologies. Okay, I can't go on about this, unfortunately. I have a nice story, by the way, to make it more visible. I don't have time for that. Okay, what you see in the data that we got is this is very much a system in motion. On the one hand, you have this conservative ideology, which is deeply sedimented. On the other hand, if you dig a little bit deeper, you see a language dynamics which is very much in motion and there's significant, significant intergenerational change if you compare older and younger respondents. Okay, this is also nice, but I don't have the time for that. Okay, what happens is VRT Dutch continues to be the pedestal variety. So fewer and fewer people speak it. There's competition for colloquial regional varieties and there's corpus evidence for the growing vitality of these competitors. For the moment, what we get now is something which is a disaster. We basically get a standard language vacuum in Flanders. There currently is no vital consensus variety which successfully instantiates any standard language ideal. VRT Dutch is perfect, but virtual, nobody speaks it. Tussetal is standardizing, gaining in modern prestige, but the conservative ideology is still deeply entrenched. And I cannot tell you how difficult this is for language planning for education. What we are doing as linguists at the moment in Flanders, and I'm quite active in it, we both describe the dynamics and we de-ideologize. I am often found on Facebook trying to explain to people that there's no, there's not only one good language, and yes, it is not such a problem to have a bit of an accent in your Dutch, and no, for variants are not mistakes. And what you see slowly, the younger generation in Flanders is learning that something should change. But write anything or say anything about the standard language, and it all goes wrong, because the conservative ideology 
is so deeply entrenched in Flanders that it will automatically take over for anyone who is slightly educated in my country. And this is not easy to work with language in that situation. Thank you. So I sign Finnish Sign Language. Thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. Um, is there analysis or maybe future plans for analysis of those who defend, oh, I'm sorry, who defend the standardized version uh, or and criticize the variation? Um, th in that sense, that uh, has there been analysis of what is their educational background? And then uh, you said that there is variation in the uh, Flamish or in the Flamish region. region. Is there some kind of uh, variation that is more criticized than others? Uh, or is there members of certain dialect group who are more active in criticizing uh, the standard, uh, standard version? And then the other question, uh, is that is there ha have you been making any kind of test or other kind of uh, experiments that do people understand this for example the language spoken in the news those who are strongly growing up with some kind of variation or dialect do they always understand everything that is spoken uh, in the news uh, I'll start with your second questions um, uh, the thing is the uh, that which is spoken on the news is perfectly neutral. It doesn't have any variation whatsoever. It has no regional flavor. It has no non-standard variant. And it is always, when spoken in news context, perfectly prepared. 90% is read and almost all the rest is prepared. So it's a completely neutral variety. And it's easy, it's perfectly possible to understand for all the Dutch. Not only all the Dutch understand it, they find it beautiful and they find it perfect. So it goes with associations of perfection, of purity. It's a typical ideological standard in this case. For the first question, I'm afraid I didn't get your first question very well. So if you could please resume it. The thing is, I don't hear very well myself on this acoustics. Yeah, thank you for the answer for the second one. So I was uh, asking that those who are uh, criticizing the variation and are thinking that there should be standard language, is there research on their educational background? Oh, yes. And also, um, what is, how are they, what kind of language users are there? Is there, for example, some kind of certain variation that is over-represented in the group of criticizers? Well, basically, the people who make this reaction, but the most critical, are highly educated people. Thing is, there was also a newspaper piece in a tabloid at Niesblad, and I analyzed, I analyzed these reactions as well. And they don't critically reproduce the most conservative ideology. Do these people speak better Dutch? No. I mean, basically, all educated people believe that one should speak good Dutch in Flanders, but nobody does it. The prime minister, who called me a traitor to my country, speaks heavily West Flemish flavored Dutch. West Flemish is a low prestige accent, and he makes no effort whatsoever to remove it. The person who asked the question in the parliament did so in a language variety which was difficult to understand. By the way, there's a link to the debate in Parliament on uh, the slide. So, uh, no, there is an opposition. There's a contrast between what people think one should do and what people actually do, which is basically nothing. I mean, they criticize the language, whereas they don't speak that language themselves. There's about 500 people in Flanders who speak that variety. And that's typically 
people who are prepared, who did their language exam for the national broadcaster, which is extremely strict. Is that an answer to your question? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. First one um, from somebody online. Um, do you know of any similar research in France? In France. Um, France is, is a much bigger country to start with, with a somewhat different standardization history. I mean, Parisian French now completely dominates uh, the, 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 the specter, but if it wasn't for 100 years, provinc provinc provincial front French would have been much more important than Parisian French. Okay, that's one point. Um, there is right-wing papers like Le Figaro in French, which will advocate the best sort of French which one should speak, for instance, is something typical is, they will give you a list. These are 90 English words that we can easily avoid, if we like, by using a French word. Typical, typical uh, reflection of that sort of an ideology. But it's certainly not that bad. I mean, what you see from attitude experiments is that non-Parisian French is not evaluated positively, but there is other prestige centers. So. Um, it partly compares to Flanders, but it's certainly not as bad, no. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, one other question directed to Nick and Liz, um, and I'm paraphrasing. <coughs> the Both of you talked about languages that are s learned from a young age, but not from the earliest age. And to what extent would you say this blurs the line between native and non-native speaker. And the questioner puts it somewhat provocatively, how, how might Western linguistics have put the non-native native distinction on a pedestal? <laughs> I don't know who wants to go first. a very good question. Uh, let me make sure I've got it right. So the non-native versus native uh, types of English with the native, uh, native speakers being put on a pedestal. English is being learned from a very young age. Yes. Yes. There's so much variation. So much variation. But I think it's a very good question because I didn't actually talk about language acquisition of a foreign language, which is a huge factor. Huge. Some people are good at learning foreign languages, and some people just aren't. It's a huge factor. But as somebody who's been educating English majors in Finland for 15 years now, gosh, that's a long time, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that they're not very satisfied, and I wouldn't be surprised but what this applies to many Finnish people in general, uh, that they're not very satisfied if they sound Finnish when they speak English. I find that rather curious because guess what? They are Finnish. And that's, what, that's one thing I was getting at when I said they have choices to make when they learn English as a foreign language. If they have the capability, maybe they want to sound like they're from New York. Maybe they want to sound like they're from Singapore. But that has to, a lot to do with actual aptitude. What can they reasonably accomplish in a foreign language? So it, if the reality for many people is that they're always going to sound like they're a Finnish speaker of English, and is that good enough? I think it is. I think if you are Finnish, why not sound Finnish? What's mm -hmm. the problem? Um, but in fact, that does seem to be the case. The, the person who asked that question is quite right, that this notion of um, being sounding like a native speaker and also native speakers themselves get put on a pedestal. I don't think it's a coincidence that somebody like me or somebody like Dave gets a job teaching English in Finland even today. I know it hurts a little bit to admit that. Dave is wincing right now, but it's the truth. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Nick wants to say something. Yeah, 
there just so I can get in front of the camera so they can see me signing. Uh, so the question was linked with uh, native and non-native and the distinction between native and non-native. I think this is a huge area in sign language research. And to be honest, there is not enough time <laughs> really to go into any depth on this topic. And um, there are a small number of deaf people who come from deaf parents, who come from deaf families. So in that respect, some deaf people do grow up as native sign language users and they are exposed to sign language from birth. However, some research has said that um, this corpus should include uh, native or near native uh, sign language users, which means looking for deaf people who have come from deaf families who have deaf parents. But the problem with my research in Indonesia is finding these people. And it seems that that group of deaf people who come from deaf families, who come from deaf parents, is a very, very tiny minority of the deaf community in Indonesia. In Europe, it might be, I'd say, 5% as a guess of deaf people who come from, you know, who have deaf parents. In Indonesia, I think it's probably much less. So the question which was, you know, which, which do we put on a pedestal, native or non-native, I think from my sociolinguistic perspective, I really firstly want to know what languages are actually there. Because if we're only focusing on, you know, pure native sign languages, on deaf people who, you know, have grown up, who have, who have deaf parents, then what we're doing is we're ignoring the vast majority of the deaf community. So, for example, talking about this idea of a pedestal, we're researching, but we're also deciding at the same time because we're sampling the examples that we want to do. So in effect, we are putting language varieties on a pedestal. So yeah, it's a very hot topic. Okay, so thanks again to all of our speakers. Um, uh, the, all of the talks will be uploaded to the website. Um, the details are on the uh, seats over there. Um, actually, I've also just tried Googling language on a pedestal, and you'll, you'll find us that way as well. Um, uh, so thanks everybody for coming and thanks everybody out there for watching the live stream. Um, that's it for that's it for today. I I for one hear a glass of wine calling my name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Bye. <laughs>